ring a ling hear them ring it's time to bitch on the podcast how does it go what's going on people welcome to the Bituation Room Podcast. I am your host, Francesca Fiorentini, in the holiday spirit. Not really, but sort of. I don't know. There's something very warm and cozy about this time. Um, it's all of 60 degrees here in Los Angeles. Ooh, brr, I'm never going outside. Um, so good to have you here. Thank you for pressing play. Thank you for uh, watching live. Thank you for being a subscriber. Um, to this channel on all of its various platforms. I'm so happy you're here. We've got such a good show. Uh, comedian Trey Crowder is here. Gonna be so fun. The liberal redneck. I have him for the next chunk of time. So super excited to talk to him about things like the rail strike that is not probably going to happen thanks to Congress. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about, you know, uh, Mr. Just Intrepid Journalist Matt Taibbi and some of his incredible releases about the most nothing burger story of the century, Hunter Biden's laptop, uh, which mostly has proven that the guy's cool as fuck. That's it. He fucks and he does drugs. Any questions? Um <laughs> Uh, but also the host of the podcast Tech Won't Save Us, which mm, can we just underline that a million times? Paris Marx is here. Uh, they're going to be talking to us all about uh, what Elon's takeover of Twitter means for finally recognizing that billionaires owning tech platforms is a very bad thing. And uh, what does this mean for democratizing the Internet? What does this mean for democratizing our means of communication? Um uh, is Mastodon the answer? I don't know. Um, very excited for that. And then finally, we got to talk about AI people. All right. Everyone's sharing their little AI portraits, including me. Why? Boredom. Why do we do anything? Boredom, y'all. Yeah, it was $6. Yes, I immediately canceled it, but we're going to talk about what can AI do next? What will it do? Is it going to slowly, it, is it working on some, some sort of like surrogate Francesca behind the scenes? And then it's going to supplant me. And then one day I'll be like, welcome to the bituation room. <laughs> Don't just bitch about it. Me about it. It like forgets what the line is. I'm excited for it. I'm very excited. We have so much to do. So if you're here, my God, like the stream right now. My God, share the stream right now. If you're listening as a podcast, why don't you go ahead and give this podcast five stars? That's how people find out about us. Um, and of course, every single episode has bonus content. That's right. A whole extra story from me to you, but specifically for the Frantifa, for those who are patrons of the show, who support this independent show that does not have 99% of the time when I remember to turn off the automatic ads does not have ads on it. Um, and uh, you can get that content by going to patreon.com slash situation room today. We're going to talk about a an entire county went without power. 40,000 people went without power for hours because it seems like somebody shot up the power, like the grid. Because there was a drag show in town. This is in North Carolina. And we'll get into that. What the... F what happened? Oh my God. It looks like... Extremists basically... Shot up an energy grid in order to prevent... People from being fabulous. Cool. <laughs> So Trey Crowder is going to join me for that discussion. Um, super excited. Also, if you're a patron, you get 20% off of merchandise, habituationroom.com. You get shout outs, you get special AMAs, you get access to all kinds of stuff. And I want everyone to know, um, we will throw up the flyer at a point, a uh, certain point, but in San Francisco on January 22nd, Sunday at 8 p.m., my God, do we have a live show for you as part of SF Sketch Fest. If you're in the Bay Area, get your ass there. Because my guest is not only Nato Green, 
but just added Mr. John Iderola in the flesh in San Francisco of the damage report of TYT. You guys, have you? can you prove John has legs? I will prove it. John Iderola is going to be there on January 22nd. Hell yeah, we're going to be live. So Dragon Squad, if you're listening, if you're watching, get there. It's going to be so fun. There's also another guest I have yet to announce, but um, suffice to say, you're going to love them. Um, sweet. And also finally, tip the show, TBR-Live on Venmo, TBR-Live on Cash App. And with that, enough yapping. Let's continue the yapping. Um, this is What Are You Bitching About? It's a very important day, of course, uh, because this is the Tuesday, the runoff between Raphael Warnock, Senator Warnock, and Herschel Walker. If Walker somehow wins, like, I think definitely we all have that part of us. It's like the part that you save room for dessert, you know, that part of your stomach. Well, this is a part of like my soul that's like save room for hope. And that that just kind of dies. Like if Herschel effing Walker wins. So for those of you listening in the future, you actually this time know whether we've made it or not. But I digress. I want to just name because it is this has been the week where uh, ironically, it's been mask off on white supremacy vis-a-vis Kanye West wearing his little weird mask on Alex Jones and and elsewhere. I'm not sure if it's Balenciaga. I'm sorry to Mr. Balenciaga or Mrs. or Miss uh, if I'm not properly giving credit to your weird mask. Uh, it might also be a Yeezy mask. It might be a whatever the hell his brand is. The point is this. Kanye West is forcing right-wingers to show their whole ass. Like, I mean, and it is the flattest, most disgusting, uh, ripply, uh, stretch-marked, just dingleberry, yes, I said it, dingleberry ass possible. But in the last week, we have been treated to a whole, we started last week, we started talking about Tim Pool, right? Random YouTuber who's got like a million plus subscribers. We've talked about Tucker Carlson and Kanye West. This week, it was Alex Jones, the next person in line to have Kanye West on their platform to basically say, look at how this gentle human has been maligned by the mainstream media, even though Tucker Carlson is on Fox News, the most watched network in the country. Look at the way he's been maligned. He's just practicing his free speech. He's just being honest. He's just, Elon Musk, right? Let's Kanye back on Twitter. This guy's been maligned. Oh my God, how could you? We're just having, we're trying to have a discussion. And what does Kanye do? He says, Hitler was right. There were good things about Hitler. Cool. Wow. So rubber hitting the road here. And uh, his little sidekick now, that white, that little Nazi, uh, um, Nick Fuentes is like, yeah, 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 yeah. He's like the the sort of like sickos meme, but the come to life. He's like, hell yeah, hell yeah. And Hitler was right. Hitler is good. Hitler did have good. Like he's like all in. But all these other fools who have to play the YouTube game, of course, and YouTube, of all the things they've let slide, probably Hitler worship is not one of those things, even though they won't let us say abortion in our titles. Talk about that later. All these other people who are like, no, no, I'm a Nazi, but I don't openly want to say it. And anyone who tells me that I'm a Nazi, I deliberately denounce and are like, you know, you're extreme. Now Kanye is going on and being like, aren't we all Nazis? And they're like, ah, uh, oh, God. Uh, well, mm, geez, how do I play this one? E E, they're getting caught out, is what I'm trying to say. That's the end of the rant. They're getting caught out on their own BS because all they talk about all day with the anti-woke BS is basically code for, I don't like minorities. I don't like black people. I don't like immigrants. I believe they are lesser than me. Um, and I don't, I don't like women. I believe they should have their rights stripped away. And yet... Part of that grift is saying, I never say that. Of course I believe all people are equal. Right? 
But now when you have Kanye being like, hey, aren't we all non, aren't we all racist here? Don't we all think that maybe, aren't we all, let's be more specific, aren't we all anti-Semitic? Whenever we say globalists, aren't we all anti-Semitic when we talk where we mean Jews? Don't we believe there's a cabal? Come on, y'all, let's say it. Let's say it with me. And they can't say it with him. They won't say it with him. Because, it, you know, they'll lose advertising. They don't want to give up the ghost because they've basically been, again, coding all their language in order to sort of lead everyone to drink. And then when there's a mass shooting that is inspired by one of their rants, uh, they can just wash their hands of it. That's not what they said. They didn't say Jews. They said globalists. They said elites. So I just love that's what I'm bitching. I'm 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 actually not mad. I'm happy. I mean, and someone wrote me and I, I had the same thought, like, Kanye, is he doing like a massive like Banksy prank? Like, is this a intent, like a crazy, most brilliantly orchestrated uh, like put on to basically reveal how all these right wingers are actually like completely full of it? And speaking of Elon Musk, who we're going to get into a little bit later with Paris Marx, Elon banned Kanye. After letting him back on, then it was like, ooh, anti-Semitism, a bridge too far, open Nazi, bridge too far. And then all the Nazis are mad as hell. They're like, hey, I, who are you talking about? Free speech. Free speech is me being able to say the N-word and that the Holocaust didn't exist. And if it did exist, it was good. Right? Isn't that what you're doing, Lil Musky? Oh, I guess you ban free speech now. I love it. I love it. I'm relishing in this moment because it's the one silver lining we have for the generalized terribleness of everything. Anywho, with that, my guest is an author, a comedian. He's part of the Well Read Podcast and Tour Group. You can check out his tour dates, so many of them, at TreyCrowder.com. It is Trey Crowder. Hey, what's up, Francesca? Thanks for having me back. Yes, thanks for being back. That's right. If people remember, this is Trey's second time on the show. So it is. happy to have you here. Um, yeah. Mr. Crowder, what are you, you bitch about on your, on your socials, mm -hmm. if, any, if people aren't subscribed, people don't watch, they're brilliant, they're, they're uh, inspired, um, they're funny, you have these rants that like give me life. So I'm wondering, what are you ranting about? What are you bitching about today? Well, I'm going to dip into those for a little bit of it because I, I kept going back and forth between two possible options because that's just how bitchy I am. And then uh, <laughs> they actually are pretty much they're uh, adjacent to the same two that you picked. So first of all, I'm, uh, I said this in one of my videos that you referenced, but I'm still bitching about uh, I'm still mad that Kanye has given right wing lunatics a legitimate like entertainment option. Right. For kind of the first time, because for so long they had to sort the most hardcore ones had to sort of pretend that like Kevin Sorbo and Scott Bayo and Gina Carano <laughs> were like the master class, you know, Hollywood thespians or whatever. Like they were they're uh, being held back, Trey. Yeah, right. For speaking the <laughs> truth and all that stuff. And then like, you know, had had to pretend Lee Greenwood's like a first ballot Hall of Fame rock god and stuff like that. I mean, I guess <laughs> if you like Toby Keith, you were in luck, you know, but or and Ted Nugent could shred a little bit, but still they had limited options. And when it came to rap, they literally it was like fat white Trump themed rappers that they found, you know, at some county fair somewhere and then prop them up outside of <laughs> oh, one God, of their rallies that. yeah that, that, that that's like all they had for rap but now they've got you know dark twisted fantasy and college dropout and all that stuff at least for the nonce so i don't appreciate that but the other thing is uh, that i'm bitching about is i really wish the american left would stop allowing its future to come down to the state of georgia or really just any southern state uh primarily because it stresses me out too much i mean i'm glad it's georgia and not tennessee that's where i'm from tennessee if it was tennessee it'd be way worse there wouldn't even there'd be no suspense and we'd all be screwed but <laughs> so at least georgia has a chance but like when it was up to georgia last time in 2020 i was like well that's not gonna be good and then right. i was wrong i was pleasantly surprised but i just really feel like though that's not dice we need to keep rolling uh as far as i'm concerned and like you said i mean i agree if herschel walker specifically manages to pull it out that's going to be <clears throat> a death nail for the last oh, he pulls it out a vote. lot maybe too much honestly yeah so uh those those two things and also on a personal note before we start the show i said i'm gonna go run grab a banana 
or something like that. But instead of just a banana, I ate a whole container of imitation crab dip because I'm a trash bag. Uh, crab salad, imitation crab salad. Because I'm a dolls. I also ate oh, a banana. That's not too trashy. <laughs> it's imitation. fake crab, crab with a K, you know. Not, oh, not, yeah, yeah. Love, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I had a banana, but it was a banana with uh, peanut butter and then also a small bag of sour cream and onion chips. So I'm also internally bitching at my own self control, which just is a running downed thing. all of Did yeah. you, did, right before we started, together, good choice. Yeah. Be all talking, that together just you know. sounds not Gross. good. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like, I wasn't going back and forth between the banana and the peanut butter and the crab. It was like, <laughs> knock the crab out first, <laughs> knock the crab out first, wash it down a little bit, then banana and peanut butter, a classic combination. Okay. Uh, oh, I love it. And then after all that, you know, top it off with one of the little bags, a little bag. I'm not a maniac of uh, sour cream and onion ruffles, but yeah, you put it all together Those five so minutes good. before going on camera and, and talking and stuff. It's just not not the best choice so i'm internally bitching at myself too so i got a lot of bitching going on right now so yeah it's, uh, good that i'm here i mean uh rolling on the floor iron chef says i could listen to this man talk about what he ate for a snack all day <laughs> so like i know trey you put yeah. a lot of thought and work into your rants and you have a lot of like <laughs> astute things to say politically but you know that people could also just listen to you like then i ate an apple yeah and, uh... <laughs> oh, you sound just like me that's great you've been, you've been practicing that that's incredible uh yeah no i don't know it's, it's honestly it's a cheat code i'm very aware of it it's like you know sometimes like i can just say big words and people like that you know smorgasbord <laughs> or whatever <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, he said a smart the, sounding thing in a dumb sounding way. That's neat. I like that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm not complaining. You well, know, it's the way that like not everybody I'm, has a cheat code. You know, so I'm. Well, I mean, lucky. my my husband Matt has a cheat code, which is he looks like Groucho Marx, and my my our baby laughs at his face more than mine, and it's like that's well, not fair. He's got the big nose. He's got the mustache. And he's got glasses. Like I can't compete. So I've never met him, but just so you know, earlier pre-show when you went to like check on the baby at one point i don't know what he was he doing came in. he came into your room he came into the room there and then on his way out he like turned and looked in the camera and held his hand up and i laughed at him is what i'm saying like i thought <laughs> like, i found well, he's it got funny hands. He's, what he, he was just like i don't know it was a funny gesture uh it sort of cracked me up so i could see where your baby's coming from is what i'm saying do you know what he said to me when he came back downstairs what he said um I shook my dick at the camera and, <laughs> and I was like, yep, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I could see him thinking about it maybe, but, uh, <laughs> he opted for just the, that. And yeah. Then he, he, left. he, he was a coward. Mm -hmm. Um, Matt Lieb, everybody, uh, Trey Crowder. We have two very good stories, juicy stories to get into. Um, and I usually have a weekly roundup. For better or worse, I do not have one today. Um, I apologize to everybody, but on the Patreon, you can listen to the ones that I was releasing while I was like a new mom, like a new, 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 new mom. Now I'm just a new mom who's tired, didn't have enough time. It was a, this is a long story to say I don't have jokes for you guys, but. Uh, babies are always a good, like they're pretty ironclad excuse in my experience. I remember I've got uh, children, no longer babies, but uh yeah, I'm no, I think I started early, but yeah, babies. No, no, that's the excuse. That, that yeah, the right. excuse is like I didn't do any of that because you know, baby, and people are like, right, we do know, yeah, there is a baby, and then you sort of roll with it. Exactly, there's a baby. Yeah. I didn't have time. Just like shut the fuck up. Yeah, right? I dare you to say something I'd about say it. Something. Yeah, and say no something. one is going to right. No, exactly. That's they're the like, thank part. you, you spared us because sometimes they're not good. Anyway, this is the week where. Okay, so this is the week where fallout um, from Congress's vote to effectively, preemptively block striking ra rail workers uh, continues. And there's a lot of discussion and hand-wringing, you know, what did Democrats do? What didn't they do? Did they sell out rail workers? Did they have to take this vote? And I got to say, Trey, I don't know how much you've been following it, but I was following it, you know, um, and I was like, there has to be a reason, right? Like they, mm -hmm. they 
tried. Mm. I don't buy that, you know, all, you know, all these Dems would sort of go along with this. And yes, I know some in both, the, you know, obviously Bernie Sanders in the Senate and, you know, a couple of squad, a few squad members in the House didn't ultimately vote to effectively break this strike preemptively. And no, there's no, there's no, so there's no saving grace. There is no part of this that's like, oh, oh, oh no, no, no. D Biden and the other Democrats totally had real workers in mind. They're going to get to them. No, it is. It looks bad from whichever way you slice it. Um, it really looks like the so-called most pro-labor president in recent memory. Um, yeah, had his Patco moment, which, you know, Reagan breaking the uh, the airline um, controllers uh -huh. uh, strike in the 80s. It feels like this is his moment. And especially because so much of this could have been preempted and this could have also been punted another 60 days. And that was also voted down. So just a little bit of what happened. For those of you who have not been following or feel like it's very complicated, um, it is. It, it is, but it's not. Uh, so this is, um, oh no, this is not what I wanted to bring up. That's our next story. This is from In These Times. Um, why the pro-union President Biden pushing a labor deal that rail workers rejected? Why is he pushing it? Um, so the maneuvering Washington this week comes after nearly three years, three years of union negotiations with the nation's highest profitable rail carriers. Ahead of a previous strike deadline in September, a tentative five-year agreement was brokered with the help of Labor Secretary Marty Walsh and with Biden's personal involvement. But on Monday... Um, over 400 trade groups publicly urged federal intervention to preempt a strike. Um, so effectively, there was something that was brokered. The the unions were like, nah, this is not good enough for me. You know, we're going to worth it looking at striking and 400 trade groups. So read big money uh, urged Biden to call on Congress to exercise their power under this arcane law, the 1926 Railway Labor Act, which hand ties uh, rail workers and to override the four unions votes and impose the September agreement without any modifications, meaning without sick days. Uh, congressional leaders from both parties met with the president on Tuesday and said they would fast track his request to force the tentative deal and stop a strike. But Sanders and progressive Democrats insisted that any such legislation include at least seven days of paid sick leave, although the unions have been demanding 15. Um, now, just for some Sorry, just for what happened. Um, Nancy Pelosi put forward two separate measures, a bill to preempt the strike and impose a September deal as it is, and a separate resolution granting rail workers seven paid sick days. Both measures passed on Wednesday. The bill to block a strike and force the unpopular agreement on rail workers passed 290 to 137 with eight Democrats and 129 Republicans voting against it. The separate measure to tack on paid sick days passed 221 to 207 with only three Republicans voting in favor. Um, and then the Senate voted 80 to 15 to pass a preemptive, basically stopping the strike. And then 10 Republic with 10 Republicans and four Democrats and independent Senator Bernie Sanders voting against it. Um, then the seven days of paid sick leave went up for a vote that needed 60. It only got 52. Six Republicans voted for one Dem Democrat, Joe Manchin, of course, voted against it. So to sum that to sum that up, Biden effectively was called on by by cor you know corporations by money and was like, "Hey, money said, hey, Warren Buffett, one of the railway mm -hmm. owners, said, "Hey, you got to break this strike. I don't give a shit. The holidays are coming up. Right. Uh, we can't afford to lose money. Actually, we can, but you know right. we don't want to. And uh, you need to do this. And so, what did Biden do? He called on congressional Democrats, Nancy Pelosi, and they put that up for a vote. Now there was an effort to have this second um, bill passed, which said, okay, there can be seven days of sick leave, sick leave, which wasn't even what they asked for in the first place. They asked for 15 days, and that did pass in the House with Republicans, by the way, and then failed in the Senate. Now. The real thing is this. When you already vote to break a strike preemptively, you're rendering that workforce impotent and powerless to take their own workplace into their own hands, to take their to take anything into their own hands. Right. So that second piece, which I understand, you know, progressives like Jamal Bowman worked very hard to get through. 
it still doesn't mean anything if you already voted to say, yeah, 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 you don't have the right to strike, but here's half of the sick leave days that you wanted. Like it doesn't actually add up. It's not good enough. Effectively, what it is, is again, Biden saying, I can't afford to have any kind of, uh, any kind of work stoppage, any kind of dip in the economy on my watch. And instead of squeezing the railway owners and having them suck it up, I'm I'm deciding to openly and publicly let these workers also be the ones to suck it up. Yeah, I, you know, um, the shameless plug. I've got a I've got my own show similar to this one that you're going to be on soon in the near future called Weekly Skews. It's every Tuesday night on my uh, pages and whatnot. And last week we were talking about this coming this building situation. And I spent the whole time just sort of like screaming at my co-host. It's not his fault, but you know, like why, <laughs> why, why I don't understand why they're doing this, you know, meaning like the demo, it seemed like this was going to happen and it was already pissing me off because yeah, they just really showed their true colors. It's bothered me for years that the Democrats haven't done a better job of like regaining their status as like the party of working people or whatever. Right. I've always thought, I thought for a long time that that's a card they should be better at playing in the first place, let alone swinging in the other direction. But it just proves that there's, I mean, with a handful of actual progressive exceptions like Bernie and the squad and whatnot, accepting them, there's no one in our, you know, country's governance that actually gives a shit <laughs> yeah. about uh, w regular people or working people or whatever. And I just think that that's a damn shame. I mean, you, the way you summed it up. Yeah, I agree. It's clearly, that's what happens. Like, you know, the fat cats, big money called and said like, you know, it's almost Christmas, right? You know how much money everybody's about to make? Like, we can't have that not happen. A bunch and of Scrooges got together and yeah, were right. like, hey, and like, so we killed the ghost of Christmas, yeah. future and present and past. And it's made all the more egregious by the fact that it, that it just comes down to something that's a straight up standard in the whole rest of, you know, the Western world or developed world or whatever you want to call it. Like paid sick leave, it's not that it shouldn't be that big of a deal, but all because of that. Uh, yeah. Like Absolutely. And, and and I think that the plight of rail workers and like sort of that sounds really dramatic, but it is, is starting to sort of break through like the fact that they often even when they're working, they get called in like to to get to like work their shift at hours of notice. Right. Yeah. Um, that they're being asked to operate trains miles long often with only two right. and even more increasingly only one operator which seems insanely dangerous mm -hmm. um and and so it's again it's like it, 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 I mean, it's some monopoly shit right it's like the if you own the utilities oh i got the train stations you know right. you're running the board well, you're doing really well they've like the train companies have been making more money while also spending less on labor like they've been cutting labor and labor costs while their profits continue to skyrocket so it's just I, that means it's the employees that are getting you know stretched totally. in and screwed over this whole time anyway and then this just sort of dumps more on top of that let me cool. just play a little bit of the uh, uh an explainer from bernie sanders um who might be the only person in reference to trey what you're saying who yeah. actually w is willing to make a break with the capitalist class is willing to say no you guys are the ones who need to eat this cost we have zero sick days the only days we're allowed to take off are the paid leaves that we have to earn the year prior to it four of the 12 railroad unions rejected a recent agreement with rail operators a main sticking point has been the amount of sick leave for rail workers if a deal is not reached or forced by congress a strike could begin after december 9th the unions that represent 55 percent of rail labor have voted this contract down there are no paid sick days in this national agreement, and that's a problem for our members. And As part of the contract negotiations, the rail workers are asking for seven days of paid sick leave. This is not a radical idea. We're not asking for the world here. We're asking for a few days off a month to spend with our family. The railroad workers traditionally have had no sick time, and now with the very, very harsh attendance policies that we're faced with, railroad workers get very, very little time off work. And it has come to a crunch point. We're seeing workers leaving the industry, 
in droves in numbers never ever believed possible. People with 15 and 20 years seniority are leaving the industry and there's a crisis out there. This all comes as profits soar for the freight rail industry, which has reduced the rail workforce by 30% over the last six years. Now, it seems to me that if four major rail carriers can afford to spend over 18 billion a year on stock buybacks and dividends, Please don't tell me they cannot afford to guarantee seven paid sick days to their workers and allow these workers to have a reasonable quality of life, which they don't enjoy today. Absolutely. The, the, <laughs> the fact that we even have to like industry by industry, Trey, like each have our own fight with yeah. business leaders about sick days mm -hmm. is just... I mean, and, I and the fact that this is like a weird carve out, right? Like, I've, I know states right. have their particulars about sick days, you know, but this is like, why is this one industry saved from that? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, people don't, uh, a lot of workers in America don't realize or don't think about, I guess, because they just don't have a frame of reference, but how shitty we are <laughs> in so many ways when it comes to working here. It's like I referenced earlier, most of Europe or anywhere else in, you know, the developed world, the standard is just completely different. It's not just sick days, but, you know, paternity leave, vacation days. Yes. I mean, all that stuff like that other people take for basic people, workers in most of uh, the re much of the rest of the world. If they were subjected to <laughs> what American workers are, they would flip the fuck out. It would be yeah. completely, uh, you know, untenable. Uh, but we just kind of don't have a way of knowing but it just it's been it's normalized so we just put up with it because you know it's, it's very it is also very important that they get those stock buybacks so they can artificially drive up the price of their stock increasing their net worth uh over you know the welfare of their employees Can't i love overlook the importance of that <laughs> totally i i think it's so incredible every time there's like a massive strike in france or like you know germany you're like what's this over and they were like oh they're you know, uh, raising the the retirement age by a month, you uh -huh. know, and they're like, ah! like, I oh, remember yeah. that there was a fire, <laughs> right, right. This everything burns to the ground. There was a protest in France and they were like dumping food out at the border, uh, I think with Spain. And I was like, what's going on? Why are there like all these protests and they're stops like shutting down the street? And they're like, oh, they're protesting spain sending in cheap goods into france and like devaluing the local like food economy and i'm like wow mm. i wish we could do that <laughs> right. we're so used to eating shit in this country and that's why i think this story breaking through and actually having more legs than just a couple days um is something to note in and of itself and if there is a strike in the future if there's a wildcat strike if there is some kind of action there is right now a gofundme to support the rail workers um maybe we can put that in the in the in the description below but i do think that has the potential to give in the atmosphere of pro labor sentiment given like the retail workers from starbucks to you know uh apple to wherever else um that it, it like I think we could be on the precipice of of a series like a, a kind of a moment a, a, a moment that um that we need I mean I think you know there's been some signs of that hopefully building for a little bit now you know what I mean like with the I mean all the the bitching employers been doing about nobody wants to work anymore and all that shit for the past you know months and couple years or however long it's been basically comes down to people just refusing to continue working for you know shit wages people do yeah. seem like they're waking up a little bit there's been other labor movements in recent months that have you know ultimately worked out and that have sort of like uh, broken through and made an impact so i mean i agree with you it seems like perhaps hopefully maybe we are on some kind of precipice I like think, that yeah if christian smalls from amazon labor union could just get on a train i feel like there'd be no stopping this movement. He's the best. Yeah. <laughs> Just send him in. Send him the fuck in. All right, we got to move on to our second story. This is the probably one of the more ridiculous stories, but um okay, so this was the week where uh former respectable journalist uh Matt Taibbi mm -hmm. um who has long been 
an opportunistic grifter um, and just a sort of honestly like a petulant asshole um, was given a series of emails uh, and internal communications uh, from Twitter by Elon Musk. So Twitter communications given to this journalist by the richest man in the world, now currently the guy who owns Twitter. And so um, Matt goes on a 20 plus thread sort of like, you know, uh, expose on Twitter being like, I'm going to reveal something so amazing to you about Hunter Biden and Twitter and how freedom of speech and please subscribe to my sub stack, but don't because I'm actually just releasing this on Twitter first. But anyway, still love me. So I was trying to like, again, duck under this like a big wave. And you're like, I just want this to wash over me and like not have to think about it. But it's actually kind of entertaining, especially considered, again, what a petulant a-hole Matt Taibbi is and has been. And this is coming from someone who thinks he's probably one of the best writers I've ever read. He used to be dope as hell. And then yeah. <clears throat> well, so I, I, his I, I, star. Anyway, I have thoughts on like, just let me. He he like people like Glenn Greenwald were banking on Hillary Clinton winning in 2016 so they could continue their contrarian Democrats are the real enemy and I don't have to think or talk about fascism. And then the fucking fascists won and they were like, shit, I don't want to be in agreement with all these people. I know I'm just going to actually call uh, free speech, use the word free speech and have that sort of be like a cudgel um, to defend against all of my crap takes, which are basically a defense of those same fascists. So I had the, uh not kept up with Taibi uh, evidently until recently he'd sort of fallen through the cracks for me I had no idea because like when I was younger my dad was a huge Rolling Stone guy yeah a life, lifelong subscriber to Rolling Stone whenever I go to the house or what I just read a lot of Rolling Stone and I know Taibi wrote for them in like the 2000s and the time when I was on fire with hatred for George W. Bush and I just Ugh. remember back then he was like you know, he was like my dude. Back then. I just remember, right. I remember him as being like, you know, both verbose and vulgar and, you know, calling W a scurrilous donkey fucker or whatever, like stuff like that. <laughs> right. Yes. You know, and like I liked him. <clears throat> and then I didn't, I had not kept up with it. I didn't realize that he had followed that uh, unfortunate trajectory that you laid out there until recently when all this. Uh, new shit started coming out and I do think it's a shame, but I guess I'm not really that surprised. Cause you, you know, you said petulant asshole. I mean, I feel like, you know, if you're being uh, honest and objective about it, that was always there. <laughs> you know, but like, Just sort I of it's not that hard to, to believe or understand, but I am sort of bummed out by it. I've been bummed out by it. I went on a deep dive a few yeah. years ago about Taibi and just a quick, digression the one of the things he did is he met up with a journalist once speaking of petulant met up with a journalist who'd read his book it wasn't his the eric garner book which i think was actually some good journalism some other book about basically his time in russia as you guys know he was a journalist in russia and sort of participated in this like kind of like a dirt baggy ironic satirical and heavy quotations publication that was ultimately pretty sexist and racist and messed up and like um was kind of like a uh like a playboy of the expat scene in russia so anyway that's his backstory he meets up with his journalist the journalist goes like um i didn't like the book actually i thought it was bad it was like a collection of some of the writing from that uh time period and he throws a cup of coffee in their face right that to me, like, I'm like, what? You yeah, I know. Like? I would never, you know, how much shit has been talked to me, uh, you know, like maybe not in person, but like, especially on the internet, I just, I would never, I've had, you know. But if someone was like, honestly, like, to be honest, like, like intellectually, like, frankly, I just didn't really care for your book. You know what I mean? It wasn't yeah. y your best. Bam, throws a cup of coffee. This is such a digression. The point is, what the hell happened? What was released uh, by Taibi? Okay, so this is uh, from The Verge. And uh, Elon Musk promised Twitter expose on the Hunter Biden story is a flop that docks multiple people. So those multiple people were two Twitter 
uh, workers and Ro Khanna, like the representative Ro Khanna's personal email was released. It includes shots of emails between Twitter's leadership, members of the Biden campaign and outside policy leaders. At one point, there's even a confidential communication from Twitter's deputy count general counsel. That's what is in it. The emails show. Twitter's team struggling with how to explain their handling of the New York Post story that broke the news of Hunter's leaked laptop files. Again, the ones in which he fucks and does drugs and whether they made the correct moderation decision in the first place. At the time, it wasn't clear if the materials were genuine and Twitter decided to ban links or do or to or images of the post story, citing its policy on the distribution of hacked materials. The move was controversial then, primarily among Republicans, but also with free speech advocates worried about Twitter's decision to block a news outlet. I mean, the post news outlet, okay, you know, sort of a gray area there. While Musk might be hoping we see documents showing Twitter's largely former staffers nefariously deciding to act in a way that helped now President Joe Biden, the communications mostly show a team debating on how to finalize and communicate a difficult moderation decision. Quote, I'm struggling to understand the policy basis for making this unsafe, one former communications staffer wrote. Will we also mark similar stories as unsafe? Asked another. Joel Roth, Twitter's head of trust and security at the time, trust and safety at the time, said the company had decided to err on the side of caution given the severe risks here and the lessons of 2016. Remember the, you know, the Hillary's emails, the October surprise around WikiLeaks um, and, and the DNC hack, etc. Jim Baker, Twitter's deputy general counsel, weighed in to agree that, quote, it is reasonable for us to assume that they may have been hacked and that caution is warranted. Musk claims that this is proof proof of government meddling, but it is plainly not. Um, Musk said, and he tweeted, if this isn't a violation of the Constitution's First Amendment, what is? But the email appears to show the Biden campaign, which is not a government entity, flagging tweets to Twitter for review under their moderation policies before the election even took place. Taibi says, even, there's no evidence that I've seen of any government involvement in the laptop story. So by his own admission. Now, who gave Taibi, again, who gave him this, this fucking shit? Taibi's handling of the emails, which seems to have been handed to him at Musk's direction, though he only references, quote, sources at Twitter. Yeah, who's left? Bitch, there's nobody left. It's just Elon going through old things, being like, here, do this. Take that. Right. Yeah, they definitely thought it'd be some huge uh, gotcha moment or whatever. I just don't, I don't think it's possible for me to care about a story that's even remotely related to that goddamn laptop anymore you know what i mean like <laughs> I it's just it's, it's like it's i don't so it's sorry to interrupt it's so perfectly no. this this gradation of grift which is i'm not defending the laptop story i'm defending the right for the laptop story to get out there i'm not defending kanye west i'm defending his right to say that the holocaust was a good thing like that do you understand the, right. the how it happens how we're just kind of normalizing like what the fuck matt taibi that's not even a story again no amount of malfeasance was found on that laptop. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I mean, I just don't, uh, maybe this is a slightly personal thing for me. Cause anecdotally, like, you know, I'm super liberal all over the internet and I've had shit pulled down, uh, blocked, whatever, you know, I, I got banned from TikTok for hate speech. Uh, <laughs> still unsure how that worked. Yeah, I managed to get back on. I, I went through this whole thing. I was like, are you like, so are you telling me that American conservatives are a protected class under your conduct policy? Because if they are, then, yeah, you got me. I, you know, right. <laughs> I guess that would be hate speech, you know, lock me up. But otherwise, that's not. And they I just I, it took me like three weeks, all kinds of back and forth. And they, I never got a real explanation, but they did unblock me. But I'm saying, like, <clears throat> I get dinged all the time. Right. By, you know, and I know it's, you know, it's snowflake conservatives who are easily offended by what I'm saying, you know, who are reporting me to the authorities to have me canceled for offending them. And, you know, absolutely. Or if you say if you say Palestine, you're like, <clears throat> you're done, you're out. But is Elon Musk taking up that clarion call? No. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's just like and then but and then some of the things like. Shit that could genuinely hurt people, genuine misinformation. You know what I mean? Medical misinformation in the midst of a pandemic is like it's should be treated a little differently than some of this other shit. But to them, it's all the same. You know, 
Right. Um, Stop trying to make Hunter Biden's laptop happen is what right. Trey and I are trying to say. Yes. It's never going to happen. But it is interesting that this CEO now um, who purports free speech deliberately handed directly and deliberately handed this internal communications to a like like all kinds of ethical journalistic lines crossed all kinds of like, you know, like, like forgets free speech. This is just kind of like weird tech overlord behavior. And to weigh in on it, I do want to bring in my guest, Canadian tech critic, host of Tech Won't Save Us podcast and author of the book Road to Nowhere. Please welcome Paris Marks. Paris. Hello. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. <laughs> Perfect. Um. What the hell? Like, that's all I want to ask you, Paris. What is going on here? <laughs> what does it mean that it was bad enough? And we'll talk about Elon, that he's been, you know, letting white supremacists back online, all this and that. But suddenly this bizarre um, attempt to expose Twitter for their suppression mm. of information. From what I read, from what you understand of this story, was there suppression of information? No, I, I I can't say I've uh, paid too much attention to what's been going on with the Hunter Biden laptop stuff because, like Trey, I'm just uh, profoundly uninterested. Um, <laughs> I I think it's a non-story in many ways, but I think it's interesting that since. Musk has taken over, he has really wanted to shape the narrative around, you know, the Twitter that existed before um, he owned it, you know, because as you might remember, there was kind of a six month period where he was trying to litigate in the court of public opinion, but also in a court in Delaware. Um, you know, around what Twitter was actually doing, around whether its its business kind of aligned with what it was saying publicly. Um, and right after he took over, he released Slack messages, screenshots of Slack messages that suggested that, you know, he was right the whole time and what Twitter was saying never really aligned with um, what they were saying publicly, right? Right. What they said internally was different and they were kind of admitting that Elon Musk was right, which was not true actually, but it's just Elon trying to shape the narrative. <clears throat> And so then if we look at like the Hunter Biden laptop stuff, it's once again, Elon Musk trying to come in and say like, look, what they were doing before was really terrible. They were right. suppressing free speech, all this kind of stuff. You know, the content moderation was much too heavy. But there's another piece there where since Elon Musk has taken over, he's also wanted to say like, you know, the world is talking on Twitter, right? What happens mm -hmm. on Twitter is very important. Um, it's where everyone who is like, having these important conversations are and where the media is like litigating these important topics. And so he wants to say that not only does Twitter provide a lot of kind of links to news stories, which is not true, like that it provides a lot of traffic. But then on top of that, that a lot of actual kind of reporting and journalism happens on Twitter, which is why he directly went to someone like Matt Taibbi to sure. say, here are these documents. When you report what is in them, they can't be on your sub stack. You need to post the thread on Twitter so that this whole discourse kind of happens there. So it's interesting yes. to kind of see that play out and what he is trying to kind of frame Twitter as, um, but also what he's trying to, um, you know, how he's trying to use someone like Matt Taibbi for his own purposes. And of course, Taibbi is perfectly happy to, to go right along with it. To expose nothing <laughs> like <Yeah. laughs> let's get back to like what was the headline it's you know it's somewhere in like the number 40 thread like that is yeah. where it is um but that's twitter so removed dick pics but matt taibbi won't actually tell you that in the thread you know yes this is the thing that the biden campaign was kind of flagging in this email that seemed to show that like oh my god they're asking twitter to remove um tweets right but actually F at least four of four out of five of them were apparently photos of hunter biden's penis um which they so I let's be think real. it's okay they took that down <laughs> we do but they're very envious of it and so yeah. <laughs> they of course wanted to see it and um elon that's musk in particular Oh, yeah. I mean, that's evidenced by their obsession with Hunter Biden making a whole ass movie about him um, yeah. again, which makes him look really cool. And they're like, give us those dick pics. <laughs> um, we can't get hard unless we see them. I'm sorry. But that's that is totally where they're at. Um, no, I think that's a really interesting thing that he used him as a foil to mm -hmm. 
put some shine back on Twitter being like, hey, you guys are leaving this platform, but actually it's, you know, it's really important and we're breaking real stories. But ironically, yeah. the people who are leaving are honestly all the people who he wants gone anyway. I mean, the people who are coming back are the white nationalists, are the people who just want to like say the N word a million times. And the people who are leaving are the people who I want to listen to are largely m women of color, marginalized voices, people who are getting death threats now or have gotten them. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's fascinating that every time he does one of these stunts as well, whether it's like some kind of tweet that's just like absolutely ridiculous and kind of sets off a firestorm or something like what he did with Matt Taibbi here, he'll then like post a tweet not long after and be like, look, engagement is on fire tonight. Like, you know, the platform is so healthy and active. And it's like, man, like all the advertisers are fleeing your platform. Like people hate it, but people like like Twitter you know, I feel like we need to understand that Twitter is a place where its user base kind of loves the drama, right? They love to yes. see like the shit going down. That's why it was so entertaining to have Trump on the platform, even though Trump was like terrible, right? Was because like you had to got to experience like his his crazy tweeting in mm -hmm. real time. Um, and so, of course, as the richest man in the world is kind of destroying this platform and kind of, um, you know, causing all of this chaos of course the user base of twitter the like core user base is going to be on there being like what is this dude doing now yeah i mean it's th that's why people rubberneck you know there's a fiery car wreck it's bad but there's a slowdown because a lot of people are like whoa is there a dead body yeah. you know that's what we're doing i mean it's that's very morbid but that's effectively what's happening um and I guess I'm back and forth, right? Initially, I was like, this is awful. Then I was like, this is entertaining. Then I'm like, this is awful. And I sort of go, I do this dance. I don't know, Trey, where yeah. you're at in terms of like. What, the Musk, current state of, tw of Twitter? Of, of Musk buying Twitter. <clears throat> uh i'm well just again just to make it entirely about me uh Please. i had i had recently had a little bit of momentum on twitter you know for whatever reason i was uh, gaining followers and whatnot and so it just checks out to me that it got set on fire and everything's falling apart and it's all filled <laughs> with nazis now it's it getting good for you yeah right That's how it works. Yeah. as soon as i started to turn a corner over there then you know it just <laughs> mushroom cloud uh yeah. so <laughs> I find that humorous. Uh, no, I don't like, I don't, if I'm being honest, I mean, look like, you know, it used to be things that actually happened were, you know, real and things that didn't were not and stuff like that, you know? And I feel like if you're presenting yourself as someone who reports facts and you report something, that's not a fact as a fact, it's totally okay for a moderator to flag that as not being a fact. Cause it isn't a fucking fact. Like, you know what I'm <laughs> like? That's, that's how I feel about all that. I feel like it's generally pretty reasonable, but also I do still feel like, like with most social media, people build their own bubbles and everything. Anyway, there's been some pretty major trash on Twitter for a minute. I'm not saying there's not more trash now, but like, you know, you could still sort of curate your own experience to a certain yeah. extent. And also, you know, I've seen people saying, don't seed the space, whatever, that type of thing too. Like I haven't left and I'm not going to leave is what I'm saying. And I'm right. still going to be just as, you know, just as annoyingly liberal thirsty. as I've been doing and yeah. thirsty. Yes. All that. <laughs> I'm not changing any of that. So, you know, but I, and I mean, and I think a lot of people are at that same spot, but I'm curious about that. The question about moderation, right. You know, like, we know that this Hunter Biden suppression story is largely BS, that the right is just trying to make it into something and Elon's trying to make it into something. Biden wasn't even in the goddamn White House when it, you know, came out. But Paris, what about content moderation um, and these private companies? You'll, you'll hear a lot of folks say, look, this is a private company. Um, they have every right to do whatever they need to do. Um, and it's kind of a I don't know, kind of a straw man. I don't know what the right framework, I mean, what to call it, but it's sort of like a crappy um, defense uh, that is absolutely true. You know, you can't really violate the First Amendment. Like, this is not necessarily government run, but maybe it should be, Yeah, right? So what What about moderation? Like, what is, where, where do we need to be? Like, where should we be in terms of content moderation, knowing how quickly misinformation and hate speech um rises 
Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I think it's important to recognize that moderation is really important, especially in these platforms that are so massive, that have such large number of users, right? Um, like, when you think about how we use these platforms, we wouldn't use them if, or most of us wouldn't use them if there was like hate speech all over the place. And mm -hmm. like, you know, who knows what other kind of like terrible content i don't even want to name it all off right but like if these things weren't being moderated then the experience of using it would be much much worse and i think that you've kind of seen that with things like parlor and these other kind of like alternatives to twitter where sure a lot of these right-wing folks like move to them quickly but then engagement dropped off really fast because you're in like kind of a, a very small filter bubble but also it's filled with like all this evil kind of hateful stuff and why do you want to see that all the time right um, i don't want to talk to that many virgins like at once <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um but then like if, if you think about on top of that you know the question is like what kind of content moderation should we have then? And the right is really engaged on this question and arguing a lot that like, you know, we need more free speech, we need less moderation so that, that we're able to say, you know, the things that we want to say on this platform. But even internal research at Twitter shows that right wing accounts are disproportionately kind of, um, what would you say? Elevated. They, they get boosted, right, yeah. by right. Twitter, by the platform. Um, you know, the left does not experience that to the same degree. It's, you know, similar to what we used to hear about Facebook all the time, right? That Facebook was suppressing conservative voices when actually all of the research into it showed that conservative voices and pages and stuff were getting massively boosted on Facebook, were influencing a lot of people right. as a result. Twitter is the same way. But you get this narrative and it gets repeated time and time again, right? It's used with social media. It's used with, used with regular cable media, right? The liberal media is suppressing conservative voices. And so then CNN and all these other networks want to have more um, Republicans and right-wingers on there to show that, see, we are providing balance, right? It we are ensuring them. that. Exactly. So it's a very convenient... Um, um, narrative for them to use that is not true, but allows them to kind of, you know, get more influence on these platforms, ensure that their messaging is further boosted on these platforms, whether it's traditional media or social media. Um, and of course, that's very beneficial to the right. And the left does not have the same kind of power and influence to have a campaign like that and is probably a bit more honest about being like um you know instead of instead of kind of making all this stuff up in order to just get a boost and so i think it's it's kind of worrying then to see how successful the right has <clears throat> been with this and how there are some people who at least kind of position themselves as left who buy into these same kind of narratives and talking points around free speech that really kind of benefit the right um, who are making these arguments and who are benefiting from policy changes in order to, you know, supposedly enhance free speech on the platform when free speech is not actually the ability to, to say things or whatever, but is actually in their mind, the ability to further boost what they are saying to ensure yes. it's not being removed while continuing to target left-wing accounts. There's already been reporting that left-wing accounts have been targeted under Elon Musk's kind of leadership of the platform. Um, you know, being banned and things like that. So that's not stopped. Um, but we need to ensure that, you know, we unban a ton of like Nazis and stuff like that who were banned mm -hmm. in years past and allow yeah. these people to say whatever they want, unless I guess they go really over the line and start saying Hitler is amazing, like Kanye West did recently. Absolutely. Th 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 that's so perfect. I mean, and yes, those left wing accounts include a lot of anti fascist accounts mm -hmm. um, and people who regularly um, call out and go after. Um, white supremacists and then make that kind of their thing they've been banned and i you know i i it's a little you know i don't want to over dramat like dramatize this in terms of like first they came for the blank then they came for the blank and sort of that <laughs> you know you know obviously the like that slow that that phrase um but there's a little bit of privilege in being like, and not to call you out, Trey, but I feel the same way. I'm like, I'm not going to leave Twitter. I don't, you know, but then there's folks who are straight up getting banned or like, I haven't been horribly hounded. I'm definitely seeing way yeah. more, way more hate, like uh, to response to my tweets, like, right. way more bullshit. And it honestly, if that increased by like, say 30 or 50 more yeah. percent, I'd be gone. Like there's no way. Um, but I know folks who have been hounded. Yeah. And there's no way they're going to stay. And so and, and my question, I guess, to you, Paris, is like, given that this platform used to be also an incredible mode of getting out the word around r striking rail workers or, you know, um, 
any whatever kind of action from from the grassroots, what happens? Like what happens now um, that honestly, we're just the beginning of this. Like we're going to see people targeted more and more and more. Um, like if they tweet out their action, maybe more white supremacists show up to it. We obviously. But what do we do? Like, where does the grassroots go? Um, do we go back to Facebook events? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, it's it's a difficult question because the the real answer is um, I would say there's nowhere else at the moment that is a real alternative. Um, you know, obviously Mastodon has received a lot of attention in the you know kind of uh, weeks after Elon Musk has taken over the platform and since he initially announced that he was going to do so. Personally, I, I you know I use the platform. I post on it sometimes. Um, I, I really don't feel that that's an effective replacement for Twitter. I feel like it's doing something different and there are particular people who are using it who like what it is offering, but I don't think that it does what Twitter does. Um, and I don't think it's going to effectively replace that. There are other platforms that are you know, trying to replace it in various ways, Hive, Co-host. I'm not super familiar with those. Another one is called Post, post.news is the URL. That one's really uh, being pushed by a lot of influential Silicon Valley types as, you know, this is going to be the one that's going to um, succeed Twitter. Uh, you know, it's funded by Andreessen Horowitz, which, you know, Mark Andreessen is part of that venture firm. He's also invested in Facebook. Um, he was part of Clubhouse as well. Uh, you know, he's taken a really hard right turn as many Clubhouse. of these venture capitalists have. Um, you don't say. Yeah, this is yeah. another right wing tech venture capitalist uh, trying to uh, float their new platform. Exactly. Are there any good ones? Like, honestly, I, I don't think so. Like, I, th I think that the thing about Twitter and the thing that has made it so kind of special was mm. that it really was the text platform, right? Like, right. sure, there's Instagram where we can post photos and stuff like that, but it's really not made like the comment section is not really made there for like a debate or a back and forth or some kind of, uh, you know, discussion, right, in a way that Twitter is, or TikTok, where it's very much like a broadcast medium, right? You're watching this, you're experiencing it, um, but it doesn't have that same kind of engagement. And if you really want to participate, you have to be ready to, like, hold your phone up in front of your face and, and say something, right? Not so many much. people, uh, you know, want to do that all the time. YouTube as well uh, is is still, you know, very video focused. So, Certainly Facebook is kind of text, but Facebook has dropped off. People don't use it anymore. So Twitter had this really kind of unique position. And I do think that what Elon Musk is doing to it right now is not really going to allow us to create some effective alternative to it. I think we're starting to see sort of a splintering as mm -hmm. some people are moving on to Mastodon or Post or Hive or Cohost or these other alternatives. But then you're creating much kind of smaller niche communities of very specific types of people who like these particular platforms. Right. But you don't have the kind of coming together of a, a large number of people, in particular, people of influence, you know, journalists, politicians, people like that, who are all kind of using those platforms and in those same spaces. So I think that if Elon Musk does really destroy Twitter, or not, and not even meaning like, take Twitter offline, because he's fired everyone or whatever, right, but just like, really kind of destroy the community of Twitter, what made it special. Um, yeah. I don't think that that is just going to replicate itself somewhere else. I think it's just really going to be lost. All right. <laughs> where's, where's, where's the where's bean dad where where do they go where do we i mean this is this is the thing about twitter is like uh i tweet very infrequently mostly because um i'm i think people in text completely misconstrue what you're trying to say and what you do say yeah. and like as someone who's a journalist and a comic sometimes i'll say something really sincere sometimes i'll say a joke you know today i was lusting over the moroccan goalkeeper uh <laughs> and there's nowhere to, for me to say that except for twitter and i don't really want to post a whole instagram thing about it right um i could but so um, but I think that like I'm missing out on that common conversation, just sort of like a something that binds us for that few, you know, those few hours, even if it is something really stupid. Right. Yeah. Um, ideally, it will be something stupid and lighthearted or if it's something that gets you kind of outraged. But generally, it won't be about like how the Wokies are taking over, you know, like I would rather not be subjected to that. Like everyone's racist uncle at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just sad. I think it is just, 
I'm lamenting the fact that we won't have that. Um, and yes, of course, the fact that a couple of celebrities follow me on there and that's sad. And you know, don't, <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe yeah. never I want to lose that. Yeah. Tell me about it. I know. I mean, Tay Diggs. That's the worst you know part. Saying? Yeah. He follows all of us. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> and straight up, anyone can buy a blue check mark now. Like, I have been yeah. seeing people where I'm like, who the fuck? Oh, got it. Got it. Yep. You. It's funny because you can click on the check mark now, too, and it'll pop up and it'll say, like, whether it's an actual verified account or whether they just paid for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Paris. <laughs> Are they going to add, like, a, it's a like, check mark asterisk? Like, what? yeah, right. Well, they, Paris, they're going to be doing three colors. So now yeah. there's going to be, like, gray for government, I think gold for companies, and blue for individuals. But it, the blue one is still like regular verified people like celebrities and people who are paying for it so i feel like eventually like they're still gonna have to split it out and add like another color or another symbol or, or something uh i got a vitally important question for this discussion since mm -hmm. you got your finger on the pulse paris do you know when they're gonna fix the the naming problem with the verified accounts do you know what i'm talking about oh i, I haven't been able to change today? my name for yeah. three weeks and see like a lot of i don't uh, know uh, comedians i use my name to shamelessly promote tour dates so okay. my name right now is trey in brea california on november 9th or whatever it's still <laughs> it's that was wow that's really early that's uh, almost a whole year away i know, I know. Year, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. and i haven't been able to i haven't been able to change it and i actually sent a thing to twitter support and i was like super apologetic i was like listen i know you guys are going through some shit right now and <laughs> yeah. I really apologize. but if you could take the time to I, this is super important to me you know whatever and uh they they actually responded and they said that you know that it's just temporary and it'll be fixed at some point, That's but they couldn't so tell funny. me when, but yeah. So, you know, we're yeah. all struggling. And they were like, they're like, we're busy with Hunter Biden's yeah. laptop. Right. Yeah. <laughs> just like a, one of Elon's many kids being put to work on, on it. Um, well, surprise he also you, guys. Keeps, you can't like um, actually buy a check Mark right now because they had to close it off because uh -huh. so many people were impersonating accounts and stuff Brands, like that. Yeah. Was really funny. Hilarious. Um, yeah. <laughs> but he, he keeps delaying it and like always has a new excuse um, because the reality is like the fundamental problem is you can't have actual people and people paying who have the same symbol or you're just going to keep getting a load of impersonations. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. I love it. Oh, that's why I was like, why? Oh, right. Because Lockheed Martin didn't say uh -huh. they were going to stop selling weapons to yeah. Saudi Arabia or the United States. And the insulin thing was a huge yeah, yes. it's not actually yeah. going to be free. Yeah, uh, right. Insulin won't be free, sadly. Yeah. Um, Paris, I do want to ask you, like, just like because of your podcast, because of the fact that you focus on this and you're so great at explaining it, what is like your vision? You know, what's your vision for? the internet i mean I, I think the answer of like there's no replacement other than obviously in person um for something like twitter or like a you know very robust uh group chat um you know it it's like it, it's a moment for us to sort of envision what we do want and what we think mm -hmm. who we think should be the owners of these platforms um as someone who's an anti-capitalist i'm like let's break it up and have it nationalized but that also is scary for certain reasons but it there could be checks and balances to make it work but listen libertarians get to fucking go off about you know their visions for the country and the world and i want to go off as a socialist you know on on my ideas for what you know how it should look and making space for you as well I'm not saying you're a socialist necessarily i'm just sort of like what do I you am. think like, what's <laughs> the, there we go so what's like what's what's the goal here what should be what if you were advising this administration or any administration what what's the goal yeah, so I could talk about this for ages, but let's just say, let's just put it this way. In my view, you know, Mastodon is sometimes presented as like socialist social media, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it has this kind of decentralized, federalized quality to it. In my view, I see Mastodon as more of like a bit of a cyber libertarian social media, you know, going back to those early days of the internet when there were these ideas around how, you know, uh, the internet was going to empower the individual uh, against the state. And we kind of forgot that corporations exist too. And we're just going to come in and take everything over. Right. Um, 
And so if we're thinking about like what socialist social media is going to look like, I would say one of the fundamental problems we have with digital technology and with the internet is it was privatized in 1995. And then we just kind of assumed that everything that should happen with it from there should be within the realm of the private market, right? Private mm. companies should be able to control whatever. There should be no role for the government, for the state, for the public sector. I would say that I think that we need a greater role for the public sector in developing technology that actually works for the public, right? That doesn't have a profit motive, that isn't designed to kind of extract money from you or data from you in some sort of way, but is designed very explicitly to serve the public in you know whatever way is necessary. And I think part of that could be thinking about what a public social media platform would look like, one that doesn't have to, you know, focus you on engagement and on ads all the time, one that doesn't have to extract crazy amounts of data from you so that it can target ads toward you. Um, you know, a, a platform that's really focused around education, around communication, around different forms of kind of communicating online that we don't have right now because we're all stuck on these platforms that are controlled by the richest man in the world or, you know, one of the richest in, in Mark Zuckerberg, wherever he lands on the chart now. I think he's down a bit because the uh, Meta's share price has fallen so much. Right. But I, I do think that that's kind of fundamental, right? Is that we need to kind of get over this kind of neoliberal idea that we need to leave so much to the private market that the government or the public sector can have no role. And like in the same way that I know it's more common up here in Canada and some other countries, but like we recognize that there's a role for public broadcasting, right? We recognize that there's a role for, of course, the public post office, right? To be providing people with mail and, and what have you. I also think that there's a role for a public institution to be creating technology for the public good and to be funded properly. So, you know, we're not just saying, oh, that's the shitty technology. We should still be using Google and, and all the private stuff, but can actually, you know, deliver things that work for people um, and that are designed with people's needs in mind. Um, and, and it can even like engage with them, right, in a cooperative way to learn what people need from technology um, yeah. instead of just developing it for, uh, you know, to make a bunch of money for shareholders. Mm, absolutely. I love that. And and I think, you know, one of the one of the things my mind goes to is like the next door app, right, which is sort of this like, yeah. disgusting way to like rat out on like, which homeless person is, you know, trying to eat like, you know, like it's like, but what it does is it sort of sells you on community, get to know your neighbors, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But it is privatized. It is only certain people. And it would be so nice if that was like part of your county, you know, or that was part of your, like your town. Like they, you know, that that was in public hands, um, not in some app again, or like, or like the citizen app to pick a worse yeah. example, right? Kind of like, um, cr like crazy surveillance shit. Like, it'd be nice if that yeah. was, I believe that app was previously called vigilante, uh, explicitly. So, yeah. it was. <laughs> to give you an it idea was, of I, how it works. Yeah. A good friend of mine did a doc on it and I, I want to have her on to talk about it, but like, I love that vision. And I guess my question is, do we move toward that vision through some kind of, um, you know, better regulation and carving out, let's say a certain amount of, I mean, I, I don't even know, like, because it's not about it's not like the airwaves or the media, like sort of the, the cable news, but um, some bandwidth, at least for or seed money or, you know, yeah. grants or whatever it is for like public endeavors um, or educational sites right considering that what like 90 percent of the Internet is porn, you <laughs> know, like <laughs> if we're like, hey, OK, I think we should have, you know, like. 5% should be educational, right? Or, you know, 10% is in the public hands, etc. Yeah. So I think there's many different ways to approach it. And I would say from both angles of what you're talking about, I do think that there needs to be more regulation of technology. You know, we can look at stopping these companies from further growing and expanding, um, like Amazon's trying to do by buying MGM or Microsoft buying Activision Blizzard, like stop these further kind of expansions of these companies, the consolidation that's happening, and also right. maybe look at unwinding some of that size that they have, but also regulating what they do to ensure that you know, the, the negative parts are more restrained um, because ultimately if you're constraining what these massive monopolies can do now, you're also leaving an opening for 
other alternatives to come in there because they can't just keep buying everything up and expanding. Right. But then the other right. piece of that is, you know, what do we do to encourage more public technology? And I would say that part of that needs to be to ensure the funding is there. And we often forget that, you know, we have this idea that the tech sector is like all private money, um, you know, all private companies, but there is still, and, and the only reason that Silicon Valley exists be, was because of public funding from the US government, from the US military, but that money still flows. Um, and we're in a moment right now where that money is flowing more and more. We just had the CHIPS Act, Act passed mm -hmm. recently to restrict, mm -hmm. um, you know, what China can do in terms of semiconductors. A lot of money went to Intel and a lot of big chip manufacturers um, as a result of that to encourage them to be producing chips in the United States. Elon Musk gets a ton of money for SpaceX and Starlink and things like that. A lot of these tech companies get public money and we don't kind of recognize it right now. So what we can do is we can say, actually, we should be taking more of that money or we should have a specific set of money that goes into kind of a public um, cooperative that develops technology for the public good that can maybe engage with libraries or other kind of local organizations to find out what people actually need from technology and then develop in response to that. So mm -hmm. there are many different ways that it, it can be isn't framed. designed around killing people. Exactly. <laughs> so like, exactly. You know, because I'm like, okay, with like a NASA for tech. And then I'm like, isn't that just like DARPA or some other like really fucked up, you know, how yeah. can robots, you know, maim mm -hmm. civilians? <clears throat> Well, and here's the thing, right, is a lot of the money for technological development comes from the military because mm -hmm. so many other parts of the government have been, you know, cut back so much over the past number of decades. But the military is kind of like, you know, you can't touch the military, right? It just needs to keep growing. And so they have the money to keep funding all of this development. And so that's why you get so much kind of technology that is oriented toward military purposes and then maybe later gets kind of like a commercial orientation, right? Um, so the, the internet comes out of the military, of course, but even self-driving cars, like the reason that in the 2010s, we had all this excitement around self-driving cars was because in the first decade of the 2000s, the military was funding self-driving car research. And then Google got word of it, got excited about it, hired some of those people and said, you know, the stuff that uh, the military is kind of trialing in the battlefield. Well, now it's going to revolutionize cities and we're all going to like get around in these robo taxis in a few years. Of course, that never actually happened. But you can just see like the relationships that exist there um, that we don't always recognize that kind of happen behind the scenes. Absolutely. Mm, I love it. Oh my God. Every word I am doting on. And, and, and also it's, <laughs> it's, you know, it is um, the United States government, you know, with one breath saying, you know, well, Amazon needs to stop union busting and then contracting with Amazon in the other, in the next breath. <clears throat> and you're like, if we were really serious about that, then there'd be some, kind of consequences um i mean amazon to me is just it's got to go it's got to be nationalized there's just no way yeah. it's too fucking big it is ubiquitous it's everywhere and as a new mom i don't want to give it up because <laughs> <laughs> i just want it to be privatized but man it's been saving my ass in these uh tough times and these sleepless nights um paris marks you're wonderful. I hope Thank everybody <laughs> listens to paris's podcast tech won't save us interviews with amazing uh, writers and, and journalists and experts on this topic that is so critical. And, and I hope you come back. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Something you didn't get to say? Something you need to plug? Nah, I, you know, I, I think, I think we've covered it pretty well. I think so too, dude. Elon actually, Musk sucks. You know, actually, I, <laughs> I, I, Elon Musk, fuck Elon. But also, yeah. I forgot I wanted to keep you on because there is one, one more segment that we wanted to do. Sure. Let's Which is, um, look, guys, I fell into this trap, all right? There's an app called Lensa. Apparently, uh, it's storing all of my images and ruining <laughs> the careers of artists all around. I, not being a visual artist, and I'll get into the kind of art that Trey and I do and how AI cannot replicate it, but... Mm -hmm. I downloaded this app and uh, it you put a bunch of photos in there and it makes you look kind of cool. Also very cross-eyed. Here we go, guys. Here's Francesca in all kinds of, um, I mean, it's my Hunger Games over here. Here I'm like a weird sexual robot cyborg lady. I don't know why it's sexual. She just looks like she's a sex worker. Um, here I'm cross-eyed, but I kind of look like <laughs> my mom. Uh, I look a lot like my mom. Here I look, I don't know. I look like Phoebe Cates over here. And then there's a bunch of other ones where I mostly look like um, Aubrey Plaza or uh, Olivia Munn, which for me is like, 
it's like the app going like, yeah, you're cute, but like Aubrey Plaza's cute. <laughs> like, yeah, you're cute, but have you ever thought about looking like Olivia Munn? Very funny. And I want to know, y'all, is this good? Is this bad? This is AI. Yai, yai. Uh, yeah, I'm terrified of robots, uh, fully. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not happy about any of this stuff at all. The, like last night I was watching Netflix with my wife and, uh, Alexa out of nowhere just stated the time, you know, like unprompted, <laughs> just said the time. And so me and my wife start whispering to each other, like, why'd she say that? What's going on? It's like, like we're afraid of her <laughs> overhearing us, you know, cause she's listening. And she, every time I see Boston dynamics, put out a new video of one of their little robot dogs doing a dance or something. I imagine it doing so on a mass human grave. Uh, cause I just, <laughs> that's just how I see that playing out. I don't know if I watched Terminator too many times or what, but yeah, no, I'm not, uh, I'm not overly on board with any of this AI Wait, shit. Wait, do you um, know that even more scary? I'm not going to say her name because she is listening. And if I say it, she'll start talking to me in the room. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you whisper at her, she will whisper back at you. Yeah, see, that's freaky. I don't Which like that. scary uh, as hell. But, I had but no this, idea. But this, <laughs> the, picture, the picture thing you're doing, you said, because I didn't know about this until today doing your show. You do, you you show it a bunch of pictures of yourself and then yep. it just makes other pictures of you okay there's a few steps first yeah, you subscribe for thirty dollars crazy to me Hang, it's uh, third wait hang on you subscribe <laughs> for thirty dollars but you totally can cancel after the but most people will forget to upload 20 pictures of yourself totally normal then you wait for about a couple hours and it spits out all these ai generated artwork pieces okay that's right. what it is. And they're all in a different genre. And you're like, oh, cool. I look cool. That's the yeah. goal. Yeah. I mean, I can see how it is cool to have the, to get those. But I'm saying I'm not like in all of the capabilities of that software. Maybe it's because I'm too dumb. You show it 20 <laughs> pictures of your face, right? And you do. it's like, okay, yeah. I'm going to take that face and put it in space or whatever. That's not, yeah. like, that's well, not the funniest crazy. part is that <laughs> Matt did it. My husband did it, but we didn't, you're not, you're supposed to give them good, interesting backgrounds because they take colors and stuff and they use that. But he just wanted all the good looking photos of himself, which he thinks is just the same face that he makes. So we uploaded like 14 of kind of the same face and the AI spit out the worst portraits. It's just him looking a little bit worse, like a little cross-eyed, and mm -hmm. a, it's the same. It's very funny. The point is that you can trick it into being bad. But these are actual people who created. They wrote the. Mm. They wrote the programs, correct, Paris? It's it's not actually a robot with a paintbrush. Yeah, I'm I'm very conflicted on them. I'm I'm very much like Trey in that I hate the robots as well. I I like <laughs> don't even own a. I won't say the name. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't have these speakers. Um, I don't have any of like the. Smart I don't home know stuff. her. You're the mom. Yeah, yeah. You're, I don't know her. I like avoid it all. I'm very. I'm very. Uh, this obviously my show is tech won't save us. So you know I'm I'm kind of. This is hardwired into me. <laughs> you, when, when it, you're, you're like you're like in the middle of your show. You're like you just call out for you know who and you yeah. tell her to edit your podcast. People are like mm, I feel like this is a conflict of interest. Yeah. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> no, no, but you know the AI art stuff. It's it's been fascinating to me because I feel like at least on the section of Twitter that I'm on and and you know maybe the media more broadly, I feel like there was this a discussion around AI art and why it was like really problematic and why we probably shouldn't be embracing it like a few months ago right yes and then in the past like few days or whatever i've seen everybody posting these ai art photos of themselves and i was like did you guys no, we forget, got over -hating like, what it. we talked yeah. about we a forget. few months we ago forget. you know we forgot. For totally <laughs> um, forgot. so I, I i haven't done it personally um i i feel like you know obviously there's been a lot of discussion on it you know in the in the past number of months as i was saying and I'm very conflicted about these kind of softwares because now the one that you see as well is one that um, is apparently writing chat GPT or something like that. And it's like, oh, look, it knows everything. Um, it can, you can put in a prompt and it can write a really kind of um, succinct essay or, or a few paragraphs about it or yes. whatever. Um, and I feel like people are kind of, as, as we tend to when it comes to these technologies and AI stuff, we're looking at it and we're kind of, expecting that it can do much more than it can actually do right when it's uh -huh. actually just i saw someone describe it as like a really good bullshitter kind of right which is yeah. kind of what it's doing it doesn't actually 
have intelligence, right? It doesn't, it doesn't know what it's mm -hmm. doing. It's just trying to put things together and replicate things that sound similar. But um, that's like a college student. Let's be fair. That's about yeah. <laughs> that's a college essay. It's mostly just bullshitting someone whose brain isn't fully formed. Just like, uh, you know, giving you an assessment of a book they didn't actually read. But yeah, yeah, I, I, th I think it might still be a bit below that. Like, it, it's interesting. I was talking to um. Zach, Zachary Loeb, who's a PhD student who looks into like Y2K and stuff like that. He's really kind of up on the history of technology. Ooh, throwback. Stuff. Uh -huh. And back in the, I think it was the 60s or the 70s, there was this program called ELISA. Um, and it was, you know, put together then. It was considered like a little kind of AI tool at the time. And you would kind of chat with it. And it was kind of like a therapist in a way. Mm. And people actually thought that it was intelligent, that it would, knew what it was doing or that they were actually talking to another person. But actually the person who designed it just knew like what people kind of expect to kind of hear back from these kind of answers. Um, and so it was not intelligent at all. It was very <laughs> dumb. But the guy who made therapist. it was like, I was so worried, like seeing how people engaged with it and how they thought it was smart because I knew that it wasn't smart at all. And I had just programmed it in this like kind of um, interesting way to assume what people, wow. you know, would be saying about this. And so now when, you know, I look at these things now, one of the things that Zach said to me was that like, it's the Eliza thing all over again, right? Sure, that happened 50 years ago, but we haven't really moved past assuming that these tools can do so much more because we want to assume that they will do so much more, right? Right. Um, and so my, you know my, what? It's so fatalistic too. We have this, sorry to interrupt, but we have kind yeah. of like this fatalism of like, well, guess I don't have to do anything or like, just take enslave me robots. And everyone's like, is it Terminator yet? And it's like, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. We still have yeah. agency people. And they're like, oh no, yeah. no, I'm, I'm a slave to the robot. Yep. <laughs> like, I think it's so funny that we're preempting that. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think part of the reason that it's better is because these systems have access to so much data now. And, you know, they're reliant on these massive data centers who that can process all of this data. Right? right. So it looks like they can do so much more and they're progressing in these ways. But really, there's just more kind of coming into the system. And as you say, like with your husband kind of uploading photos that didn't work for what the system wanted to, you can reach these kind of corners where you put something in that it doesn't fully understand and it spits something out that makes no sense because you've reached, a, you know, a place where it hasn't collected data on something and so it can't you know present something to you that looks like it knows what it's actually doing or talking about and right. just as you were saying on automation there like remember there was a moment in like the mid 2010s where there was all this all this discussion around like the robots are progressing so fast they're going to be destroying millions of jobs within a few years we're we're going to have no jobs for truckers in a few years and mm. look at where we are now in this, right. in this pandemic um and, you know, it was all a load of hype that assumed that these technologies were going to be able to do so much more than they could. Always and we do and this it's, over and over. And it's sorry. It's I'm so excited about this because it's also used and we're talking about rail workers. It's used as a way to preemptively precare, make precarious exactly. someone's job um, and be like, well, see, the, the, the robot is right here. I was chomping at the yeah. bit. I mean, in any moment now, in like a year, I mean, 10, I mean, 30, yeah. I mean, uh, you <laughs> Don't know, ask like, for better because then we'll just get the robot to replace exactly, you. Right? Same exactly. Same with the Amazon workers, right? Don't unionize because then we're just going to bring more robots in to do your and job. They haven't, even though and we keep hiring so many more of you because we need you. Oh, my God. Yes, totally. Um, but. Okay, for a go around, and then we'll we'll get the hell out of here. What would you want to see automated by AI? What do you want AI to do? And what do you not want AI to do? I will go first and just say, the head of Google AI a couple years ago, I was on a panel with him, and he said to me, I was doing stand-up for this panel. He, it was a BBC Arts Hour thing. He said to me, he goes, um, do you know the one thing that I haven't, we haven't been able to program robots to do? is to tell a joke like they can tell a joke that you've pre like loaded into it but instinctually on its own um writing a joke saying a joke or finding something funny like humor we couldn't do it and we can't do it and i was like yes you know what i mean <laughs> like take that burlesque dancers and clowns and other people that comedians <laughs> compete with on a regular basis you know what i mean like like the one thing trey yeah, there's, there's never going to well, be a tray who can take do your tour dates for you, bro. Yeah, I heard that. Uh, I'm not convinced though that Netflix isn't writing some of these 
their movies with uh, some form of AI or something. Yeah, because they're pretty shit lately. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Definitely and writing. Like, uh, yeah. They seem like an algorithm spit them out or something. But yeah, now what I would want an AI to do, I mean, I want to say, I want to say nothing because of what I already said earlier. Like, no, fuck robots, right? But like, I know myself, and dude, I'd be that fat fuck in the Wally chair. Uh, you know? <laughs> Like that, that stuff starts coming out. I'll let them do whatever they want uh, or whatever they will for me. You know what I mean? They can rub my feet, whatever. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'll just let it happen. I know how I am. <laughs> I just can I can I just say that I what I want AI to do is to just be on hold. Yeah, with, on like for like my yes. healthcare bullshit for I me agree. and like oh, sort yeah. me through all of that and talk to either other AI or real people. I don't give a shit. I just don't want to be on hold. I want it to like, yeah, change flights for me. See, the Beyond solution to your healthcare problem was just uh, public healthcare. So then you don't need to do that. Anyway. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> yeah. whoa, Paris. Slow <laughs> down. Ridiculous. Slow down. Yeah, that, that, now we're getting greedy. <laughs> Instead of tech solutions, maybe we need political solutions. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that is the thesis of your podcast, I know. <laughs> yeah, um, <right? laughs> what do you think, though, as, a, as such a hater, Paris? Yeah. See, what I would... I would love to be able to automate my chores, right? Like, I don't want to do laundry. I just want the robot to do the laundry or like totally. to clean the house or something like that. Um, but the thing that we find again and again is that the robots can't do that. And actually, mm -hmm. it's like poorly paid people who end up doing our chores. Because like, you know, if you think about the gig economy or so much of what um, Silicon Valley was focused on, like in the early 2010s, it was really like, you know, you have this group of young people who came out of Stanford. Um, they don't have their moms anymore. And so they need they don't want to do the stuff that their moms <laughs> used to do for them. And so, like, we need tech solutions to what mom used to do. And wow. so that's where the gig economy kind of comes from. A lot of these services. Um, and it's why a lot of the companies provide meals, provide laundry service, all this kind that's of stuff, because, amazing. you know, you kind of keep it like a like a dorm or like your mom's house. Um, and so what we actually find is that the robots don't take over those things. Um, we just get really poorly paid workers and find ways to like pay them less and treat them like shit or or pretend that there's a robot doing it when actually there's a worker behind the computer or behind the screen or something that you don't realize is there um, yeah. as is so much as is so often the case. So I would love the robots to take over my chores, um, but I don't think they're going to do it anytime soon. Uh, and so we should make sure that those people are like treated good. <laughs> I want to, I want a robot that nurses yeah. nurse your robot. I mean, just the whole kit and caboodle, you know, I want to say that Netflix like, this made is... a movie about that. Did you watch it? No. Did mother, they? mother. I, it's either called mother or I am, maybe I am. Is mother. that with, is that it's with a, a robot raising a, a girl raising a human girl in the far flung dystopic future. And then does that work out? Wild. What do you, what do you think? Yeah. It's just, like uh, it yeah, it's all just like finger painting sessions and rainbows and shit the whole 90 minutes. And then it goes off. I'll just tell a you. A robot. Mother that's, daughter that's, story, that's, if, but with a robot. if you're talking about like a, no, a mother a and robot, I would say yeah. there's a movie called Frank as well. I don't know if you've seen it mm -hmm. where it's like an old kind of retired man. And his friend is like this robot. And apparently he used to be like, um, a jewel thief or something like that and the robot is like oh i need to like cheer him up we need to do something fun and so they start doing jewel heist together him and the robot that's it's cool. like a really sweet movie <laughs> yeah. oh that's yeah. sweet as well, hell sounds, i like that. that sounds nice that yeah. mother shit sounds patriarchal that sounds like see this is what happens when you don't actually breastfeed no, you don't def, bond it's, with your baby it's 100 a you know robot murder future movie it's in that <laughs> like the well, one of the most popular genres in all of sci-fi like it's one of those can we just go out with this uh little image from elon you know you say the future is bad but elon is elon's talking about the starship oh taking beings of earth to <laughs> mars guys and somehow and all it looks... those animals are gonna die when they yeah. try to breathe martian air <laughs> wow first of all those giraffes invested heavily in dogecoin okay so that's why <laughs> They're getting on, but but the people here are being, oh, look, held back at gunpoint. Oh, shit. I missed that. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Isn't that cute? What the hell? Because that's oh, what happens. Well, yeah, only two people can get on the arc, right? Yeah, two by two. And it's right, already. Yeah. So it's, 
Elon. It's Elon and, acknowledging like me and whoever my, you know, eighth wife at the time is will be on there with all drafts yep. and shit, but you peasants. And the babies. Watch whoever us, will take uh, my IVF, you know, yeah. genetically altered babies right. uh, who he are will, going to rule the world. Elon <sighs> wouldn't even take anyone else. He would just take his like, yes, the IVF babies. He would just take the zygotes or the, <laughs> you know, the, the embryos already. Ugh. Ugh. A whole colony oh, of Elon can you imagine? have you seen the photos of his kids like it's it's so weird to see photo there were he went to like where was it the vatican or something and brought some of his kids along the summer um mm -hmm. just and like just to see the photo of him and like a few of his kids um and like to see his face on like these younger bodies it's like so disturbing oh, <laughs> oh god oh god that is really that upsetting is all right don't kids work though yeah. yeah, I know. But you know, <laughs> you are kind of putting your face onto a smaller person. <laughs> that's pretty much all it is. Yeah, I mean, it is that's, weird, yeah. it's a good survival instinct. Honestly, yeah. when I get mad at my my daughter, I look in her eyes. I'm like, those are my eyes. Yeah. Can't throw her out a window <laughs> I, now. I, She's yep. got my face. Nope. Yeah, right. I that is it. exactly what yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> Gray is a parent, clearly. Um, yeah. Thank you guys so and I'm much. Not, so. <laughs> Everybody doesn't have those dark thoughts, Paris. Uh, Paris, yeah. <laughs> everyone follow Paris Marks on, I don't know, all the bad platforms. Even um, Twitter. Yeah. Even Twitter, uh, at Paris Marks. And uh, listen to Tech Won't Save Us. Thank you so much. Also, roadtonowherebook.com. That is uh, Paris's book about the S Silicon Valley and some of the things that that you were talking about. Um, Lots in, in there on of... Elon Musk. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. When did it come out? Uh July fucking this year let's yes road to nowhere everyone get that go buy um, it it's it's actually if you buy it through verso books which is the publisher the link yay. is on the website they have a 40 percent off deal maybe it's 50 percent oh. off deal right now it's like their end of year sale verso is great for sales so love yeah. verso um okay get that book give, gift it get it read it this <laughs> holiday season thank you so much be very well and trey crowder mm -hmm. everybody follow trey where can at, we follow you? At Trey Crowder. Just uh, as long as you see the incorrect way in which I spell my name here. Yeah, it's that on all the silly platforms and also my website, TreyCrowder.com for tour dates. And yeah, listen to my podcast and all that good stuff. And I appreciate you. Yeah, T-R-A-E. C R O W D E R. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to do a little bit extra right. with Trey over on the right. bonus. So get over there. Patreon.com slash situation. Are you going to you gonna be super mad at me if I can't now? Cause we went a little long. I just no, I, I won't be. I okay. won't be. Well, I don't want the bonus fish people to think I'll be there. And then I, di I don't. So I had to interject, but yeah, no, we did go very long. That's okay. I mean, yeah, I'm fine, but I do kind of need to bounce now. Because, Dude, I need to bounce. Yeah. But I, <laughs> I'm going to do this. Uh, I know that's that a fascinating being... way to end this uh, part. Of oh, no, yeah, yeah. this is a great, great, solid stick the landing mm -hmm. outro. But mm -hmm. Trey, thank you so much yep. for the time you did give to us. <laughs> yeah. And I'll see you ne hopefully next time. And everyone yeah. check him out live later, dude. And thank you guys for being here, for sticking with it. God, it's just such a good conversation. So I had to keep it going. Um, a couple comments uh, from all y'all out there. Joyce M., Saying, I voted for Raphael Warnock today. Hell yeah. Oh my God. Fingers crossed. Um, Camperman5000, what's up? Says, Trey Crowder is French for third Crowder. Love that. Or very Crowder. Can't remember. I don't know if that's a joke or something real. Um, Sir Mill says, Walker is a walking fever dream. Indeed. Um, fun P, thanks for the super chat. Peace and love from Portland. Let's go, Georgia. Um, Mr. Spock, it looks good for Walker Wolf. It's a full moon on the 7th. Werewolves gain strength closer to a full moon. Oh, God. Um, Reiki Dragon asking about Kanye. Do we know it was Kanye under the hood? Sounded a bit like Stephen Miller. Absolutely. Um, Hef says, where is Senator Herschel Walker? It's a full moon. I think you're completing. I'm like, who said? Oh. Yeah, you're talking about. Yes. It's clearly, we're talking about Herschel Walker being a werewolf. Why? Although he kind of, he kind of looks like when Michael Jackson turns into a werewolf in Thriller, there's like a midpoint. He a little bit looks like that. Um, Darren Skjolsvold says Biden should have ended the strike by codifying the demands of the workers saying, hey, workers, you're right. So we're going to take it from here. And that still helps the economy. Um, yeah, I mean, he could have 
still broken the strike and then said, we're going to have 15 days. Let's get that across the finish line. And interestingly, Republicans who voted, I mean, they voted down the seven days, but they could have punted this 60 more days and then worked to, to gain um, to gain some support for that, right? To gain support for 15 days and still avoided the strike. But again, 400 business leaders um, called upon the status quo Joe to do what he's going to do and swing it in their favor. So I don't know what where we go from here, but you're right. It didn't have to necessarily go down like this in a million different ways. Um, Amy Rugala, thank you for the super chat. You rock, Francesca. Thank you for inviting Trey. He's one of the best out there. Ugh, agreed. Um, King Apo on Twitch, please explain to a naive European from socialist paradise how politicians can forbid a strike. Why would the workers give a fuck and not strike anyway? I mean, it's a 1926 Railway Act. I think it's long overdue. I mean, out of date. Um, Robert, thank you for the super chat. The good things about Adolf, he's not alive. He had a funny looking mustache. And according to Mel Brooks, Adolf was an excellent painter, two coats in one afternoon. That's funny. Um, yeah, this is why you need to nurture your child's artistic instincts, because otherwise you get a Hitler. Um, Marshall Ghetto on Twitch. Twitter should be a public utility. Um, or Orpheus Alcon on Twitch. AI is funnier than right wingers. Hef saying my Roomba is so uh, offended by now. Schmegly saying podcasters can be replaced. Wow. Wow. No, we cannot. And with that, y'all, let's do this. Um, thanking everyone who supports this show with the fart song very very soon so i want y'all to know that um but i want to thank everyone for becoming a patron at ten dollars or more benjamin martin you rock to anthony farnon thank you for joining the franny pack get that long part um oh i had a big tipper that i don't have on me right now but i saw it and thank you so so much next week i will get to you um to the twitch subs let's look at them damn it damn it damn it damn it hang on hang on hang on that's the sound of me fucking that up but I'm going to get Twitch subs for y'all right now. I just forgot to do the pop-out chat. Hang on. Hang on, love. We'll cut this out. Just just note the time. Note the time. Cut it out. Uh... Thank you so much uh, for this hype train. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, Dory B for resubscribing four month anniversary. I nearly forgot this was coming. So part glad to be part of the Frantifa. So glad to have you. Um, Willie Gus resubscribing at tier one for uh, you've been subscribed for 23 months. Oh my god. C Man Assassin 420 gave out 10 community subs. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you so much. Uh, Centaur Dragon resubscribing at for one month at tier one, three months, saying thank you for providing an awesome and funny approach to the news. Bituation Room is one of my fave shows. Uh, you're one of my fave uh, people. Thank you. Susie Rock cheering 100 bits. Um, thank you so much. That really, really means a lot. Depressed Progressive resubscribing. 17 months in total. Uh, 17 months with my new favorite mama. We missed you. I missed you all. Hunger Games 1989 resubscribing for one month of tier one. Subscribe for 11 months. 11 months with Franny and Trey Crowder. Um, Seaman Assassin back with another community sub. Thank you to the the cheers to ZX227 for 100 bits. Willie Gus 100 bits. Budgie Snugglers 100 bits. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, I don't, you know, it's okay. And ZX227 saying, Francesca, this is long overdue. You're amazing, funny, and informative. I love having you read the news and make me laugh at stories I wasn't sure I could. Thank you for subscribing. Uh, two months going strong. Never forget about y'all. And of course, never forget about the people who helped me make this show happen. To Paige Omek, uh, my producer, to Maximilian Inhoff, Andy Vasoyan, and Alexandra Ornes. We stream every Tuesday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Again, 
Stay tuned for the bonus. I'm going to do a little bit more if the baby abides. Um, and I'll see you next week. Remember, uh, fight the power. Fuck the patriarchy. And don't just bitch about it. Be about it. Later.